everyone. Welcome to Unchained, your no hype resource for all things crypto. I'm your host, Laura Shin, a journalist with over two decades of experience. I started covering crypto six years ago, and as a senior editor at Forbes, was the first mainstream media reporter to cover cryptocurrency full time. This is the October 26th, 2021 episode of Unchained. My book, The Cryptopians, Idealism, Greed, Lies, and the Making of the First Big Cryptocurrency Craze is available for pre-order on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Bookshop.org, or any of your other favorite bookstores. Go to bit.ly slash cryptopians. That's B-I-T dot L-Y slash C-R-Y P-T-O-P-I-A-N-S and pre-order today. The Crypto.com app lets you buy, earn, and spend crypto all in one place. Earn up to 8.5% interest on your Bitcoin and 14% interest on your stable coins, paid weekly. Download the Crypto.com app and get $25 with the code Laura. The link is in the description. The Nodal Cash app makes earning crypto on your smartphone as easy as turning on your Bluetooth. Nodal Cash is private, secure, and available on iOS and Android. Visit nodal.io slash unchained. That's N-O-D-L-E dot I-O slash unchained to start earning Nodal Cash. Today's guest is Abe Sutherland, an advisor to the Proof of Stake Alliance and adjunct professor at the University of Virginia Law School. Welcome, Abe. Thanks. Thanks, Laura. Today, we'll be discussing a provision in the infrastructure bill that amends tax code section 6050I, and we'll be talking about its implications for people transacting in crypto or even NFTs. But first, Abe, why don't you give us a short history of your professional background and how you came to be involved in crypto and what your current involvement is? Sure. So I'm a lawyer, uh, but got interested in uh, cri cryptocurrency and its fundamental economics, which led me to some tax questions because uh, uh, tax issues were some of the most practical elements of, of a proper understanding of how uh, decentralized and uh, cryptocurrencies work. That got me interested in substantive tax issues. And what we're about to talk to about today is actually very, very different. Um, it's not substantive tax, um, but it came up in the, in, the, in the context of the tax code and this infrastructure bill, and that's what brought my attention to it. So let's dive into the meat of the discussion then. Tell us about this proposed amendment to Section 6050I. What does it require? Well, the first thing is uh, to, to point out that this is something very different than what a lot of people are familiar with in this infrastructure bill. This infrastructure bill was passed by the Senate in early August, and it's still pending now in the House. And what we heard about and what eventually garnered headlines and a lot of attention and including debate on the Senate floor was a different section uh, regarding the definition of a broker that would be required to report their customers' uh, tax information to the IRS. Um, this is different. This is a separate amendment to that same bill, um, but unfortunately hasn't gotten the, uh, the attention, which is what I've been focusing on. This provision, as you say, it, it's an amendment to tax code 6050I, requires recipients of digital assets in a lot of situations to verify and record and report uh, the personal information, the social security number, address, additional personal information of the person from whom they are receiving the digital assets. And under the current rules, to report that to the IRS within 15 days. And so, why have you been sounding the alarm about this? Uh, primarily because I think it kind of slipped by uh, and didn't get the attention it deserves. And we'll we'll talk a little bit about why uh, it might have slipped by. Uh, but the first reason is this was in put into um, an infrastructure bill, a spending bill, and it was justified there uh, on the grounds of offsetting some of the cost of, of the spending in this infrastructure bill. It's known as a pay for. And generally that's saying, hey, how are we going to pay for this? We're going to say increase taxes or maybe close a loophole or, or do something that, that might increase the amount of taxes collected. So this was justified as a tax provision. But one of the key points I want to emphasize here is that this really is not a tax provision as we typically think of it. This is a criminal statute. Uh, it actually creates uh, a, a felony um, that... Uh, is concerned with the collection of information. And then a little deeper than that is concerned with really fundamentally guiding and controlling how uh, transactions are made. So this is designed to discourage peer-to-peer -peer transactions and transfers of digital assets. And um, what the statute says is that when a business receives digital assets over a certain threshold, and we'll talk about that, um, it's their duty to verify personal information and to report it. Right now that's on a, uh, an IRS form 8300. And I mentioned that because I encourage people to look it up. This is 
uh, uh, an existing law and an, and an existing requirement for another type of transaction, which is transactions in physical cash between two people uh, who we can presume are transacting face to face. So the reason that this provision didn't get the attention immediately that it should have is it, is it uses an old statute. This was passed in 1984. And it was designed to discourage uh, large cash transactions as it basically an anti-crime measure, anti-money laundering, uh, anti-tax evasion. And, and, it, and it governs um, transactions between two people face to face. And that's what it says. It says, if you receive cash in this situation, over $10,000, uh, you need to fill out this form and promptly file it with the government. So let's walk through various examples of what complying with this requirement would even look like for different types of crypto transactions. Um, why don't we just start with the basic payment? We can walk through some really clear applications, but that's one of the problems here, and we're going to explore that too, where it's very unclear what it will do and how much discretion it gives uh, to the Treasury Department. Um, and again, some of these uh, violations can be felonies, which is which is unique in the tax code, even for, for reporting provisions. Other reporting provisions, um, if there's a violation, it, it might be a misdemeanor, but this one stands out. Uh, for A, being a felony, and B, uh, most of these reporting provisions don't really affect end users, end consumers, end businesses. They're designed to, to utilize uh, middlemen like brokers uh, and, and, and employers who have this information and lean on them to report this information uh, to the government to ensure proper taxation. This one is very different in that it uh, puts that burden on anyone and everyone. Um, so uh, in a straightforward situation, well, you know what, let's start with the, with the cash example, because th there we can see where it's clear. And then we can start seeing how this leads to impossibilities for enforcement or at least compliance. The first thing is to note that the, the, the statute is triggered and the requirement to file a report whenever uh, a person uh, in a business situation receives cash. It has nothing to do with the tax consequences. It doesn't mean that that's might be taxable income, doesn't mean that it might even be revenue. You can be in a custody situation, right, where you're holding, somebody hands you $15,000, and in some circumstances, it's your duty to report that, even if you're not going to keep it, even if you have no claim to it. So um, in that situation, in the cash, cash scenario, you are required, the regulations are very clear, you must inspect an ID document and, and, and verify that they are who they are, and then collect a bunch of information. The statute requires a social security number, a name and an address. And then there's more information required. They want to know the occupation of the person who's paid you uh, the, the, the cash, um, the nature of the transaction and other details about it. When you receive that, then you have to fill out this form 8300. And again, I encourage people to take a look at it and uh, file it with, mail it or file it online with the, with the IRS within 15 days. So that's a straightforward transaction. If you go tomorrow, uh, and buy a car and pay with cash, this is what will happen. They will ask to to inspect your ID. They'll ask you for your social security number, and they will fill out this form 8300. And I did see that you wrote somewhere or somebody wrote somewhere that on average, it takes 21 minutes to fill out form 8300. Yeah, that's one of the reasons I encourage people to look at this this form and look at the instructions and look at the manuals. It's a lot of detail. And that's right. It's, it's they, The government itself estimates it takes over 20 minutes to fill out one of these. And so that was a basic payment. What if we're doing more like a, a crypto trade, peer-to-peer, -peer, um, two different digital assets for each other? Then, then what? Right. So what one thing your your hypo gave of uh, a trade of digital assets is we, let's pause and focus for a second on the on the definition of digital asset in this statute. So what it says is any receipt of a digital asset. And this was discussed um, in connection with uh, the infrastructure bill. This this very broad definition, and it means any form of digital value. Uh, basically involving distributed ledger technology. And it might even be broader than that. And it gives tremendous uh, discretion to the Treasury Department to say what exactly that is. So what that means is um, um, not only is this, you know, Bitcoin when used for a payment, but it could be any form of, of a digital asset, but certainly including things like NFTs that we don't think of as, as payment devices. And that also makes clear that um, you, you could definitely have a situation where the statute on its face commands both people uh, to report on the other, because again, this is based on receiving a digital asset. It has nothing to do with you know the tax consequences. So, a situation where one party ends up with an NFT, another party ends up with some cryptocurrency. On the face of the statute, they both have to report the other social security number. And what about 
cases in which someone's transacting with a smart contract, does this affect that type of transaction or no? Well, there's in some sense, there's a lot of open questions because again, and this gets to why uh, people haven't really focused on this, the statute was absolutely presumes that you're talking about two humans handing over physical objects. So, you know, there's some def- there's some details about what it means to be a, a, to, to receive something. Um, but in the context of digital assets, yeah, it's kind of open the up in the air what the what the outer limits of that would be and what happens if it is mediated by uh, a smart contract. But we can at least assume that in you know in certain cases or or, or think about multi stake situations, you, you, you three people, three different parties receive um, uh, you know in a two of three situation who who who. Who might be committing a felony if they don't report it? Um, so, so, so those are questions about the nature um, of a receipt. But we can certainly say that in uh, a lot of situations, you know, if, if there's assets in an address under your exclusive control, that's very likely going to be a receipt. But it also means uh, it, it's hard to imagine in the cash context somebody not knowing, right? But these are permissionless, often payments. So, uh, what happens if you uh, quote unquote receive digital assets and are not? Uh, aware of it, or you didn't invite uh, the transaction. Because again, it's your duty then to within 15 days under the current rules uh, to have verified and reported the information about the the sender on the other side. But thinking about smart contracts, maybe you had some, I've got more thoughts on that. Maybe you had something particular in mind about. Uh, Not necessarily, but obviously there are situations, right, where for instance, um, let's say that you and I are engaged in some kind of transaction and we decide to use an escrow contract Mm -hmm. um, rather than an actual third-party escrow service, then would you just report my personal information when you do this reporting or I I, I don't, or maybe it's just something that's not resolved. (laughs) Well, it's not resolved, but it's worth asking these questions because it exposes how in congruous this statute is with the technology that we're dealing with. Um, and there are, but it's a great question and we, and we should work through it to kind of speculate on what that would mean. If, if you put money into a, uh, an escrow contract um, and it won't be unlocked and in my possession till a future date, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, my guess is if I were trying to comply with this tomorrow, I would say, you know, it's not mine until I have, you know, some intuitive notion of, of control over it in terms of what a receipt means, but it, it's a very big open question. And again, one that you don't really run into in the context of, of physical cash because you're both there and you know you know when you got it. Yeah, I guess another one would be a peer-to-peer lending happening in DeFi, but those assets are pulled. So again, it's not clear if they would require that somehow, <laughs> um, you know, it is tracked and then uh, the recipient has to has to report. But, um, okay. So let's actually just discuss another issue that you raised earlier, which is the threshold, Mm -hmm. which is $10,000. So is that just whatever the value of the digital assets are on at that moment of the transaction? That's the most likely interpretation, especially if you're dealing with something, anything other than a dollar denominated coin. Yeah. It's value on the time at the time or on the date. Um, but, but the issue of the threshold is really important for other reasons. And again, we have to emphasize why this is just so different than, than physical, physical cash, because with cash, you can say, oh, well, if it doesn't, if it's not a big transaction, it doesn't qualify and you don't need to report it. But the rules are actually more complicated than that. It's the transaction has to be at at over $10,000 and that can include related transactions. And it can also include payments over time, which, which under the rules would be one transaction. So, uh, Laura, if I lent you know if I lent you uh, fifty thousand dollars in some digital asset and you made recurring payments back to me, what the rules say is that is that's one transaction. So as soon as those payments add up to ten thousand dollars, that's what triggers the requirement and the fifteen day window to make a report. And if you continue to make payments when those uh, add up again to ten thousand, it trips it again. So. Number one, um, you've got this duty to, to, to monitor and these valuation questions, which you raised, um, but also explaining why with digital assets, the, the whole definition of a qualifying transaction um, you know, can be much, much broader uh, and extend over a period of time. Yeah. And another issue, of course, is that prices change a lot, even within the course of a day. 
So if I make a payment to you of $9,500 in Bitcoin or you know something that's uh, similarly volatile, then who knows whether or not the IRS might say, no, 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 this was $10,000 based on the closing price of that day. So, um, so yeah, so that's another issue. So, um, do you, what's your take on how possible it is for the sender and recipient, uh, to comply with these rules? Because, uh, one other issue was that I saw that they're required to keep these records for five years and just kind of on a, a security level, um, I just could imagine this could lead to a, lead to a lot of identity theft. <laughs> Because you would like you'd have to give your information out to all kinds of people that you were transacting with. Well, I guess it depends on how often you transact in ten thousand dollars or more. But still, um, if they're required to hold it for five years, how could you be certain that they were holding it in a way that was secure? Absolutely. So this this puts all kind of, uh, opens up the, the, this typically behind the scenes practice of, of certain surveillance, usually conducted by entities like banks or employers that kind of already have that information in place. And it, and, and it applies this surveillance and storage and security burden on any business, um, as well as some others that might, might want to be involved. And so that it, it, it's a very big concern. So not only um, is, is there a requirement to verify and gather this information. The, the, the first requirement is at the end of the year, you have to send a statement to everybody uh, whom you've reported during the year. And then just as you mentioned, you must keep these records uh, for five years. So it, it really radically expands um, kind of the implications of the surveillance efforts that the that the government is looking for um, by, by uh, opening it up to potentially any business um, and even broader than that, I want to make a point about that. So this applies to uh, applies to receipts in the course of your trade or business, and and um, it's kind of you know we we tend to know it when we see it, but it's important to note that that's not defined clearly in um, the tax code. It's actually a, a test which is applied by courts, and it has to do with whether you have gain seeking activity that's suitably continuous uh, and regular. That, that means that you're uh, doing something in the course of trade or business. And, and, and that's important to note because uh, even even that definition, it could be unclear whether, whether certain activity meets that test. If you're a miner, if you're a staker, if you're doing various lending activity or uh, uh, significant trading, in some cases that can put you into the category uh, of, of, of trade or business, but it's not a clear line. And again, these are felonies. Um, so so, so the, the, the difference can be really important in terms of your compliance and legality. Yeah. And uh, so I did see that that would then be punishable by up to five years in prison and a $25,000 fine, which it just out of curiosity, actually, why is the penalty for this so much more than for other violations? Well, there's some interesting history on this and, and how this, uh, you know, this, this original law was passed in 1984. Um, and then periodically over the years, it expanded, even this provision expanded. Actually, we should go back a little bit further. Uh, and this is really important as well to understand how this fits in with other forms of regulation that, again, you know, some of us in crypto are familiar with, uh, but it's mostly behind the scenes. And that is uh, the Bank Secrecy Act dating to, to 1970. And what's key there is, is the provision that began with uh, requiring banks, but only banks, to report uh, very large $10,000 transactions. And in 1970, that was a big deal. Uh, relative to to now, because ten thousand dollars then is you know sixty five or seventy thousand dollars today. Um, so as uh, inflation is eaten away with that, these thresholds have not changed. So in nineteen eighty four, um, uh, as a part of a large tax overhaul, this provision was added, and then over the succeeding years, there were gradually amendments to it, which number one turned it into a felony, because again, this is really not uh, so much about tax; it's about uh, crime fighting. So in 1988, as part of an anti-drug bill uh, at the height of the drug war, that's when it, this was escalated uh, to to a, fi a five-year in prison uh, felony, um, as well as other little changes, right? So some people might be familiar with the concept of structuring. So when there's a rule that says you can only, you know, uh, you have to be reported if you do something over $10,000, first thing people do is, oh, I'll bring $5,000 in today and $6,000 in tomorrow. So that's a crime. So, so the, these Different elements were added, um, including most recently, I think, with uh, the Patriot Act in 2001, strengthening and kind of closing down loopholes and, and increasing the amount of uh, 
punishment here. And it reminds me of one point that's really important here. Some people might say, well, I'm not a business and I'm never going to be a business. So I'm never going to have to report if I have a receipt of $10,000 or might add up to that over time. Um, but it's important to see how this, th th this um, creates a felony, again, five years, for people who, who transact with others. So if you're even a consu consumer uh, making a, uh, a payment of $10,000 or more or, or in related transactions, if you interfere with, the other, uh, with that business's duty to report the transaction, that also is a felony. So if you try to dissuade them or you give them false information or give a, a false social security number, um, that too can be a felony. Yeah, but I, like uh, this thing about what you're required to give them. Um, when I read the, you know, what the requirements are, which are name, birth date, address, social security number, and occupation, it just feels like you're giving away all the information that someone would need to, like, fake your identity and and just you know open a credit card with your name. Um, so I, I don't know how many people are going to be willing to do that. Um, but anyway, one other issue that was interesting was obviously crypto transactions are push transactions in which the recipient, you know, doesn't have to do anything in order to receive a payment. Mm -hmm. So what would happen if someone unknown to the recipient sends them more than $10,000 worth of crypto? Well, the first thing to note is, is if, uh, uh, if that recipient says, hey, you need to give me this information and, and, and that party says, you know, willfully refuses, A, that's a felony. So what's, what's going to happen in practice? Look, there's so many unknowns about how uh, the Treasury Department is going to try and make this, this work. But, uh, you know, thinking kind of commonsensically about what you, you do in these situations is, 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 is the business will report it with the available information, uh, right? And then, and then uh, do their best and say, hey, I've tried my best. And then it's up to the IRS to use those uh, those clues. I, I bought a car a few weeks ago and I paid in cash just to kind of experience this. Um, and I was talking to the guy uh, who sees Form eighty three hundred a lot, and and, and he he was asking for my social security number, and he and he made kind of made a joke. He's like, "Well, if you don't give it to me, you know, no big deal. I'll make a note that I tried to get it, and then you know the IRS will give you a phone call." You know, he had he had the rest of my information. You know, he would have done his duty, and then I would have gotten a call from from the IRS. Hmm. Okay. So, so maybe then it wouldn't be, I mean, you know, as you say, the, the penalty for this is considered a felony, but it seems like at least when applied for cash transactions, people who typically work in this area don't seem to think it's such a big deal if they don't dot all the I's and cross all the T's. No, no, no. It's more, it, look, uh, actually, it's, it's a very good question. There's all kinds of different penalties. And the truth is, and when it's a felony, that's a crime and you get a jury and reason, you know, prove it beyond a reasonable doubt and you have questions of intent and so on. So, but, but the fact that it's a felony is really important because it can be used and that's hanging out there. But there's a lot of other options for the government to do in enforcement. And typically it's, it's, it's fines. And those, you, you said a maximum of $25,000. Actually, in some circumstances, $25,000 is the minimum fine for a certain mm. type of violation, but minor violations can, can also result in uh, smaller fines. So it's not always going to be a felony, but the, the, the fines are very high. But the fact that it's a felony uh, is important, and it's important for raising attention to what was done in the course of uh, a spending bill, right, in, in, in a tax provision in a spending bill, because it really cuts through and makes, it, it should make really immediate and aware to the, to the public what is going on in terms of uh, government efforts with regard to digital assets generally um, and these tax issues, because so much of this, uh, and you know, we lawyers who work in this space are familiar with it. And, and in fact, a lot of people are because um, th th these questions about what's going on in Washington, people do pay a lot of attention to it, but this really makes it more immediate and puts it in our face because, uh, because of the way it uh, affects kind of end users, businesses, and even us just using digital assets. So in general, what effect do you think that this provision could have on the effort to move to more decentralized business models? Okay, so to, to, to look at this, we got to look at kind of the next level implications of this. And that, as I mentioned before, the Bank Secrecy Act. So uh, we have a very confusing uh, uh, regulatory hodgepodge in the United States with the different agencies involved in this. But here I want to focus on something in particular. So this, this provision, which is now sitting in the House to be passed, is ostensibly, you know, and literally a tax code provision. 
but it works together with other regulations under the Bank Secrecy Act. And the Bank Secrecy Act generally doesn't regulate you and me. It regulates banks and financial institutions. And financial institutions is actually a much wider category now than people thought. If you're a a money transmitter, and that means you know uh, cryptocurrency exchanges and others, that that turns you into a financial institution. That brings you under these Bank Secrecy Act regulations. Those regulations already require financial institutions to report, just like this does, uh, cash. When I say cash, now I mean physical cash. If you transactions involving uh, more than ten thousand dollars worth, those regulations, and this is complicated, but they do not yet today include in the definition of cash these d- digital assets. Not yet. Now, uh, back in last December, there was uh, new regulations proposed with the outgoing uh, administration in the Treasury Department. And one of those was uh, to inc- alter the definition, in, in not in the tax code, but in the, under the Bank Secrecy Act, to include digital assets in that definition, thereby requiring financial institutions to, requ- uh, to report certain of these transactions. Now, what's important here is, and people remember, uh, there was a lot of uh, response to that. There was initially an expedited period for for public comment, got a lot of press, and there was some pushback, and eventually they extended that period, and those regulations are still pending. Um, But at least during that time, you know, it was open to public review, and there were, were, were comments and criticisms of this measure in terms of what it would do, including for issues of privacy and record keeping, right? Um, even for financial institutions that suddenly had to perform all of this verification and reporting of, of certain types of transactions. But here's the key thing. That new regulation hasn't been passed yet. This provision, unlike that, unlike the Bank Secrecy Act stuff, which only applies to financial institutions, this applies to everybody, all businesses and anybody you know working in the course of their trade or business. And unlike even that regulatory process, um, it was put into a spending bill with no discussion. And this creates a, a, a felony um, for the rest of us. If this goes into effect, if this 6050 IGO amendment goes into effect, without the Treasury Department's uh, Bank Secrecy Act regulations, we've extended to everybody something that which met with very serious concerns, even when applied to merely financial institutions. So that's an important but very complicated point to help explain how, how inappropriate this procedure was. Even if you know uh, somebody says, hey, this is a good idea. We need to do this. It's worth it to kind of cut down on tax sheets or whatever, whatever the ultimate justification is. Um, uh, we should be able to find agreement that this is not kind of procedurally the way to, to, to do something that is, is so important. The other reason it's so important to talk about uh, the Bank Secrecy Act Let's, let's assume now that the Bank Secrecy Act catches up with uh, this new felony, which applies to all of us. The only exceptions to this reporting requirement, and this, this is the case now under the cash one, is if that transaction is already being reported by a bank or another financial institution. Okay? Why is that? Well, that's the goal. We, they, if they're reporting it, they, you and I don't have to. And this is why. In your course of your trader business, you you withdraw fifty thousand dollars in cash from a bank. That's the reason why you don't have to report the transaction, and including the information from the bank. Sounds absurd, right? Why would you have to do that? Well, it's because they're doing it for you. So, what is the kind of uh, fundamental structure and intent of this provision? It's to discourage the use of before it was large amounts of cash. Now it's to discourage the use of digital assets. Why? Well. The government would like to uh, uh, track and 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 observe and be able to uh, account for these for these transfers. So it inc- it discourages the use of peer to peer technology uh, in, in two direct ways. The first thing is, hey, I don't want to take down your social security number, Laura, and and be on the hook for for all of this stuff. And forget I don't want to give it to you. You don't want to give it to me, so forget it. Why don't we just use a bank transfer? Okay. That's the first instance. Like, forget you know anything digital to begin with. Let's just go back to the complete legacy system. But the second thing is, even if we want to kind of nominally use digital assets, there's why not funnel it through your bank? Why not why not use an existing financial institution and therefore they take the surveillance and, and reporting responsibilities, and we don't. Now maybe that's a good idea, um, and may, and maybe digital assets. You know, it's just too costly in terms of compliance and all these law and order objectives, but we need to have that discussion. 
right? Because that very clearly is designed to uh, eliminate the peer-to-peer feature of, of this technology. And if, yeah, so, some people may view that as uh, uh, purely something to be avoided, but uh, a, a big decision like that should not be hidden and not analyzed and tucked into uh, an infrastructure spending bill. Right. So in a moment, we're going to talk a little bit more about the government's kind of intentions here. But first, a quick word from the sponsors who make this show possible. With Nodal Cash, you can earn crypto on your mobile device for free with no hardware to purchase. You just download the Nodal Cash app, turn on your Bluetooth and start earning. Nodal Cash is private, secure and easy to earn, whether you're on the go, stuck in traffic or even while you're sleeping. You can even repurpose your old smartphones to earn Nodal Cash. Visit nodal.io slash unchained to get started. That's N-O-D-L-E dot I-O slash unchained. Join the Citizen Network to earn crypto on your smartphone 24-7. With over 10 million users, Crypto.com is the easiest place to buy and sell over 90 cryptocurrencies. Download the Crypto.com app now and get $25 with the code LAURA. If you're a hodler, Crypto.com Earn pays industry-leading interest rates on over 30 coins, including Bitcoin, at up to 8.5% interest and up to 14% interest on your stable coins. When it's time to spend your crypto, nothing beats the Crypto.com Visa card, which pays you up to 8% back instantly and gives you 100% rebate for your Netflix, Spotify, and Amazon Prime subscriptions. There is no annual or monthly fees to worry about. Download the Crypto.com app and get $25 when using the code LAURA, L-A-U-R-A. The link is in the description. Back to my conversation with Abe. So from the government's perspective, what would you say is the purpose of this provision? Like, do you think that they're actually trying to get people to use the banks as opposed to using these digital assets on a peer-to-peer fashion? Or do you think it's just the tax reason? Like they just think people are avoiding taxes or, or what do you think is the real reason for this? Yeah, this it, it's tough. And it's like, I don't want to speculate on kind of the mental states of the the people who actually put this in too much. And that's one of the reasons why it's a problem, right? We don't have an explanation. We don't have uh, uh, clarity on what the evil is that this is attempting uh, to address. So people say, well, what, what what would I propose? And I say, well, I don't even know what the problem is. It, it, it hasn't been stated. So that, but but it is fair to look at this structure of this 1984 law that's being repurposed to do this. And that there, it is clear that this is uh, a crime fighting effort, uh, and it's an attempt to go after, uh, starting in the 80s in particular, kind of uh, drug money and and money laundering, and to discourage the use of cash. Um, and that's that's very clear. And another point on. Kind of how this is used in the past and, and, and present, um, and why this is kind of so odd to treat this as, as a tax provision. These forms eighty three hundred that we've been talking about, um, these are used as in, in fighting crime. They're, they're distributed to federal and state law enforcement agencies to help build cases, not about necessarily tax evasion, um, but about anything. Because hey, who who and why would somebody be be um, uh, having and holding this much cash, and it provides grounds to to go investigate people. So we know that much about the history of this provision. Um, beyond that, look, there are there are absolutely legitimate and very serious questions about kind of peer to peer technologies, right, um, and the ability to 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 do things without. Uh, but but these des- deserve very serious discussion and an understanding of of competing values. And one thing we haven't talked about yet. Uh, and, and it's important to get clarity on what the law does before we turn to kind of legal issues. Is, is this is very problematic uh, un, under our legal principles, and we have a Fourth Amendment which protects us against unreasonable searches and seizures. And there's a whole history there about how the Bank Secrecy Act was upheld in the face of some of these challenges. But there's very serious differences here, where um, at least with banks, it's a third party that's that's in, put in this position and is reporting. Uh, people's private financial information to the government for these various tax and, and other crime fighting purposes. But here we're enlisting our neighbors and our uh, other Americans, other American businesses and saying it's it's our duty to 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 report on them. And that's very different. Right. It's different legally. Um, it's different in its in its impact on people. And, and it works to kind of uh, undermine and, and intentionally. So I think the technology that we're all kind of excited about. Um, but there are there are very serious concerns about 
whether it's counterterrorism or uh, tax enforcement, other other crime fighting. Um, but on the other hand, we've got uh, a Fourth Amendment and we've got principles of of, of privacy, and those um, those need to be addressed uh, in the open and not slid into uh, a spending bill. Yeah, and before we get um, more into the Bank Secrecy Act issues, I did want to just ask. I did see Market Watch reported that supporters of this provision say that these reporting requirements are needed so the IRS can collect taxes that are owed to the government and that this would just put crypto on the same playing field as cash. Do you agree with that? What's your response to that? Yeah, it's important to, to point out a few things. Uh, first of all, Form 8300, you're not reporting income. You're not reporting even um, revenue or anything. It's just, yes, it, in some sense, it could expose uh, people who are working in the cash economy um, who who aren't already um, have have their their transactions tracked and traced by by going through the banking system. But I'd love to see an explanation of how that actually works in light of what we already know about the history of this provision. Calling it on the equal footing, there's some something seductive about that. You know, what's the best case for this scenario? If you're if you're a lawmaker and presumably don't understand that much about digital assets and what is enabled by this whole realm of peer-to-peer technology. There's one way of looking at this, of uh, uh, looking at a Bitcoin, right? That you say, you know what, that Bitcoin has something in common with, you know, drug money in, you know, wads of hundred dollar bills. And that is one person can hand it off to another person and the IRS and the Department of Justice might not hear about it, right? That's the argument. If, if you only see in digital asset technology, um, the, this element of, of, of what it accomplishes, you can see why. And you say, well, wow, we've got this 1984 law and nobody really knows about it because it's, it's accomplished its goal, right? People don't transact. In, why, why would we transact in, in wads of cash if it involves this legal burden and a risk of fines and so on and me having to get your social security number? So it's, it's to the extent uh, cash wasn't already on its way out. Yeah, of course. Now it's the case. Yeah, you're probably a criminal if you're using large amounts of cash because who else would do it? Who else would subject themselves to sharing their information and, and all of these uh, risks of, of, of getting audited or, or even prosecuted under the law? So it's accomplished uh, its goal in that sense. I mean, that's the best you can come up with is, is uh, if, if you only see Bitcoin as an alternative to uh, you know, a suitcase full of cash, um, you can maybe see an argument for uh, for extending this. But um, there's a much bigger picture, obviously. So going back to um, the constitutional issues, Coin Center's director of research, Peter Van Valkenburg, believes that this provision is not constitutional in its original formulation, let alone in this uh, provision applied to cryptocurrencies. So can you explain why it might not be constitutional and how it's survived this long if it's not? Right. So again, we have to start with uh, the cases that upheld um, the Bank Secrecy Act rules in the 1970s, which was really was a big development, right? Um, and I think it's important to look at this in the big, in the sweep of history. Banks have evolved over hundreds and hundreds of years to facilitate different things. And it's only really in 1970 that uh, the, the government focused on them as kind of a, uh, a middleman and a centerpiece of, of holding access to information that would serve the government's ends in crime fighting, uh, money laundering, and, and, and tax evasion. So starting in 1970. And th- those were challenged. And the Supreme Court's uh, basis for saying, that, no, this doesn't, the bank sharing of this information does not violate people's um, a, a kind of standard expectations of privacy is saying, hey, you've handed this information over to a bank and they're a third party and this is information that they record and you know that they've got it. So if they share it with, with us, you can't complain under the Fourth Amendment. What's different, uh, two things have happened since then, or two themes that are important. The first is just to note how 6050i is very different, right? This is not about a bank. This is about you and me, right? This is a situation where I'm not going to ask you for your social security number and all of this personal information as a normal course of me getting this from you. Um, and the government is uh, both demanding that I collect it and then and then share that. So in other words, the third party doctrine, uh, which is the basis for uh, the Supreme Court's approval of these other uh, uh, collection techniques imposed on third parties like banks, um, doesn't apply here. And the second is that um, even that doctrine, 
of uh, third party doctrine um, has been getting additional scrutiny as it's expanded over the years. And I won't go too far into these more recent cases, but uh, basically it's, it's saying, hey, just because people share information with third parties doesn't necessarily mean that they no longer have a reason, reasonable expectation of privacy. So those are the two themes uh, which differentiate this, and, and especially when it's expanded to something uh, like digital assets. So if this provision does get passed, which it looks like it probably will, what do you expect will happen? Wow. Well, you know, it, it hasn't passed yet, and, and I'm not a parliamentarian or, you know, uh, expert on, on kind of how these things go. So my first emphasis is, is, hey, this law hasn't been passed. And once it's passed, it needs to be signed by the president. And until that's happened, people need to uh, make their voices heard on it. So the first step then, if it's passed, would be to repeal it. Um, but then as, as indicated by this discussion of Fourth Amendment, absolutely, there will be uh, legal challenges. Yeah, I did see Coin Center mm -hmm. saying it would be prepared to make a constitutional challenge so then for that to happen, does it just entail finding the right case to take to court? That's right. That's a, 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 its own complicated endeavor, uh, bringing a, a well-informed, uh, well-considered legal challenge that, that uh, allows the courts really to, to address the core issue. And um, just actually going back to kind of the different use cases, uh, or not use cases, but app, like ways in which this uh, provision might be applied. So for something like a purchase of NFTs, would that, I, I guess like, you know, I, it goes back to what you were saying about how it's not clear for some of these transactions, how they're even taxable events. So if the government is saying that this reporting is necessary to collect the, all the taxes that they're owed, then which of some of the different examples that we discussed are actually taxable events in which they would collect taxes from that transaction? Well, it, it's important to emphasize again, this really is not about that. So like in the broker provision, right, the separate thing that, that involved this debate, one of the things that, that they want from brokers is information about the, your, your, your cost basis, right? Things that are very relevant to, 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 to calculating tax. That's not what's going on in this provision. Again, you might have zero tax consequences. It may uh, lead them to say, oh, here's somebody with a bunch of cash. Let's investigate and see if they've been hiding more cash. But there's no direct connection. There's nothing on the face of the Form 8300. It's not even among the information there uh, for, for you to, to explain what the tax consequences would be. So um, there's, there's really nothing. Oh, that's fascinating. So I guess I don't I don't fully understand. So the IRS requires form 8300 for cash transactions over $10,000, but do they ever collect taxes based on that information that they're provided? I'd have to look more closely, but I don't think the form 8300 on its own ever would give information that directly determines a tax liability. It will tell you um that uh, that business received ten thousand dollars, and then if 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 that ten thousand dollars isn't accounted for in in the tax returns, it would give you some place to look. But again, you, you're exactly right, Laura. This is this is this is an important point. It, it it does not lead directly to any tax consequences. I mean, I guess so. Like going back to the NFT example, one you know way in which I could imagine it resulting in a taxable event would be if I create an NFT and then I sell it to you for more than $10,000, then that's earnings for me. So would that be an example? Yes. So, so you, you file this uh, return as the, so, so you're the recipient of my digital assets in this example, right? So you sell to me an NFT. I end up with an NFT. You end up with uh, that money. Yes, the IRS could use it, but I don't think that's really how they do use it. Again, this is another re reason why this provision is such an outlier in the tax code. It's really less about the recipient, which are typically you know businesses, than it is about the payers. The IRS is looking for information about the who are these who are these people showing up and paying fifteen thousand dollars in cash for a car, or buying gold or something. Or an They're NFT, looking, or, or now an NFT. The fair understanding of of the purpose of this is less about the business, right, and more about the person sending cash or now digital assets to the business. Okay. So what do you think would be a better solution here to achieve the government's goals? Again, I want to kind of stay firm on this. 
I, I don't know what the government's goals are. We don't because they didn't announce it. It wasn't discussed. There wasn't a committee report. They weren't uh, an explanation of what this this evil is. And that's important really for, for kind of gathering opposition to this. Even if people are saying, hey, you know, we need to be more careful or we could, who cares about the Fourth Amendment and who cares about financial privacy? Uh, th- those people could still say, well, at least we should discuss it. And we should hear what those 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 different concerns are. So I don't I, I don't know what the alleged uh, danger really is. So I don't want to um, develop it too soon, except to acknowledge, yeah, these are some very deep questions, which is why the technology is exciting. Um, unlike uh, you know, fifty years ago with the Bank Secrecy Act, b- banks and these and, and these financial institutions turned out to be a really useful choke point for the way the world has evolved since then. They've become really important in ways that they weren't 100 years ago, but starting in 1970, they are. And as as this technology opens up new possibilities for for all kinds of things and uh, through peer-to-peer and, and its other features, uh, that threatens um, that old order and a, a system for maintaining surveillance um, that the government's become very comfortable with. That's a big issue, sure. I uh, and it needs to be addressed. But uh, we also have uh, expectations of, of privacy. We have principles of autonomy. Um, uh, and uh, we have a Fourth Amendment. And we have a general principle which says, hey, uh, in, in this country, at least, you're free to do things without asking permission. And if the government wants to stop you, they need to explain what they're doing and justify it. And certainly that's the case. If they want to attach a felony crime to something that today is completely legal, and which is uh, something enabled by uh, a new technology. All right. Well, what do you think the crypto community should do to address this issue? Wow. I mean, that's that's I'm fighting for uh, attention at this point. And if and if we get it, uh, that's that's a good question. Um, as we know, the 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 vote in the House has been postponed several times. They're now saying it might happen as soon as the 31st. Who knows? Um, but. Um, you know, I wrote a report on this. Uh, you mentioned it for the Proof of Stake Alliance. I, I, I urge people to look at it. Um, and, and I tried to lay out the elements that we've been discussing to, to explain what this does. But I didn't try to list all of the terrible consequences because there's too many and there's too much uncertainty. But it applies, you know, to straightforward kind of Bitcoin trans- transactions. It, it has a special importance for this wild new world of, of NFTs. Uh, and we, and we, we at least have to spend a minute on DeFi for people to appreciate how uh, potentially, and you know, the text of the law could could be effectively criminalizing things uh, in a way that it may be impossible to comply with, right? Because this 1984 law just doesn't make sense. So, as to what people should do is is uh, read the report, read the statute, read read the information available on it, and ask these questions. Questions that uh, uh, its sponsors in Congress did not ask, uh, did not ask Treasury to explain, and start um, uh, ex- ex- exposing the, the the consequences to it in whatever way it works. And uh, hopefully, there's a uh, look. We 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 definitely are starting to get attention uh, on on Capitol Hill. Um, the fact that the the vote in the in the Senate went through so quickly, you know, kind of made it much more difficult to 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 get people to to dig into this. But I think it's uh, starting to happen. So. 6050i that that last digit on the 60 it's not a one it's an i let's let's get it to trend and get people to 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 ask why this wasn't uh, considered more carefully all right great well where can people learn more about you and 6050i uh well as of this event uh or this issue i'm now on twitter at at abe sutherland you can find links there please look up the proof of stake alliance uh look up 6050i download and and read that report um and try and ask those questions about how this will apply. And uh, uh, yeah, start start with the report. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for coming on Unchained. Thanks, Laura. Thanks so much for joining us today. To learn more about Abe and 6050i, check out the show notes for this episode. Unchained is produced by me, Laura Shin, with help from Anthony Yoon, Daniel Ness, and Mark Murdoch. Thanks for listening. 